everyone. Uh, greetings and welcome to this uh, panel uh, about the new film, Value Chain, from innovation, from uh, production to distribution. My name is Alvaro, I'll be your host. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Virtuals, a collective that works on innovation in film production and animation. And I'm joined by these four amazing panelists. We're missing one. Uh, so Simon, we're thinking about you. Um, so, and we're going to talk about a few revolutions that have happened in the past few years uh, in film production and animation. So I'm talking about real-time animation, real-time game engines, uh, such as Unreal Engine being used in production. Uh, I'm, I'm also talking about virtual production. And Luisa will, talk, uh, will tell us more about that. Um, about AI, but also Web3 being used to finance and create new projects. And what we're going to try and do is to see what is actually the, the reality of it. The, the, we're talking about a lot of promises and a lot of hype. We're going to try and decipher this to see what is actually going on and what is actually possible. So maybe we can start off by introducing ourselves. I've already introduced myself, so maybe Luisa, if you want to tar uh, start and tell us about you, your company, mm -hmm. and then sure. uh, we can get started. Uh, so my name's Louisa Bremner. Uh, I work for a company called Lux Machina. Uh, they are um, one of the leading people in virtual production at the moment. Uh, so we run virtual production stages all over the world, from the US to the UK. Um, and we tend to work with really big productions. Um, we, we were on the series one of The Mandalorian. Uh, so for anybody who doesn't know what virtual production is, um, there's it's essentially bringing real-time technologies into film production. So it can be anything from virtual scouting, uh, using augmented reality to see set elements when you go to uh, scout film locations. And it's also the huge LED stages that people might have seen uh, where you actually bring real-time VFX uh, into the, the film studio during shoot. And you, um, you essentially have your VFX in camera as you shoot. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we mainly do at Lux Machina, and uh, yeah, I mean it's it's a huge it's a huge step forwards in film production. I think it brings film back to the golden era of Hollywood, where you would imagine uh, the director to be able to see what they what they were going to film in the view in the viewfinder. So. Mm -hmm. All right, that's great. Um, and maybe related to virtual production, we can talk about also real-time game engines and animations. So, Quentin, if you want to introduce yourself as well. Uh, hi, everybody. So my name is uh, Quentin Auger, or Quentin Auger, if you want. Um, I'm the co-founder and uh, head of innovation of Dada Animation, a 3D animation studio that is actually not far from here in Paris. I've been working in the in animation field for 20, 25 years. I'm afraid. Uh, and 25 years ago, actually, 3D animation was new. It was uh, actually Pixar didn't even release their, their first uh, feature, and uh, everybody has to, had, had to be invented. But in the last 20 years, standardization came, and we, we inv invented actually uh, jobs that have a name now. And uh, and we've been doing the same thing, the same way, with more and more powerful computers and softwares in the last decades, but uh, something happened in the last, uh, let's say, five years ago. Uh, uh, game engines, but also many other tools uh, arrived. Uh, actually, uh, what I used to say is uh, it's, it was a collision of different industries, or galaxies, actually, industrial galaxies. The one from the animation, the VFX, the cinema, the games, but also the web, the, the way to, to develop tools, to deploy tools, and now Web3 comes and crypto comes, etc. Uh, so two years ago with my ex-colleague, uh, we've been working together many years, we've decided to uh, to experiment uh, actually real-time technologies, which is actually the, the, the name I, I don't really like for game engines ap applied to uh, animation in our production, and we decided to, to actually move a step forward and, and create a new animation studio focused on that. So that's my job to test new techs and to implement them in animation. So for the one who are not uh, expert on, on, uh, on that field, animation is what is, you know, let's say Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse versus all other Spider-Man movies. <laughs> Spider-Verse is the animation part. Or here, actually, actually, a couple of blocks uh, away from here was uh, was created the Arcan series, 
uh, by Fortish Production, and uh, with uh, Riot Games, that's you know the animation development of a, of, a, of a game actually. So that's that's my job to work on that field, and, um, and we are more specialized in non-realistic animation. So I will be speaking of uh, what brings what uh, what brings uh, real time AI and stuff like that in. Uh, in pure animation field and uh, and uh, the gains and the pains of it. Awesome. Um, and talking also about film film production and 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 the Web three part of it. And maybe Daryl, if you can introduce yourself. Yeah, my name's uh, Daryl Fannin. I'm a writer producer who's worked with Matt Damon, Peter Berg, Jimmy Kimmel for Netflix, Disney. Um, when I got to Hollywood, I realized that there is um, a lot of money that's actually being taken from artists that we don't know about. There's uh, this thing called Hollywood accounting in which you know, Star Wars The Last Jedi was made for less than $33 million, brought in $475 million in the global box office, and yet somehow it was a complete loss uh, because of these corrupt accounting practices, which is great for the corporations and the studios who own the projects, but it's terrible for the artists because we never see any of the back end or the residuals that were promised. And so I launched Kino to help uh, stop that. And we're going to launch film and television on the blockchain and protect artists' rights. That's great. I, 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 um, I have heard um, the term Hollywood uh, accounting. I, I, I heard the Martian accounting because it's, no one understands it and yeah. it's so alien. Yeah, it's a completely alien language. That's right. And it's, it's really insane. They'll do crazy things like uh, on one of my first shows, I was charged $10,000 a month for a parking space, uh, which is absolutely insane. And again, great for the studio, not so great for the artist. That's just parking in Paris. Um, all right, so uh, maybe Olivier, uh, if you can take the floor and introduce your, your, yourself, last but not least. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Oliver. I am uh, the producer at C7 Production, and I am the director of uh, Be My NFT. It's a documentary on NFTs, and the idea of this film is to explain to people from here in the, in the room and on, in the street what NFTs are, why, why they are going to change our world, normally in the best part, <laughs> for the best, uh, why they don't need to be scared about this, because uh, you will see in the movie, it's a long part of the process of our evolution. Uh, 3,000 years ago, people are already tokenized goods or things uh, or give value to something who was stoned. So you will see that in the movie. And so the movie is still in production. We started to shoot in Liverpool last year. I met uh, Mondoir, Faye Washers, after we went to uh, Miami during the Art Basel. And I met many people from the field, like Cathy Eckel, Avril Kinini, Swansea, Samuel Hamilton from Decentraland. So all these people are already in the movie. And now uh, we launched uh, earlier this month an NFT collection. Uh, to help us to raise funds and to build a nice community around the project. Because for me, I think it's the future to again, your audience, to touch your audience, since the beginning of the project, uh, the first lines of the project. And uh, the idea is to, you, you join us and to make this, this movie uh, together, all together. Awesome. Um, and so maybe if we can talk about this, uh, the, the whole process. Um, so first, the, the development of new ideas, of new projects, of pilots. Um, maybe, Constant, since you're in the animation field, you can tell us more about that. Uh, how profound are these changes brought in by, the, by these new tools? Uh, are we seeing new projects? Is it really a shift in the landscape, or is it more of a cosmetic change uh, oftentimes? So like many topics we can hear of these two days, uh, these, uh, the changes are, we are the beginning of something. Something is happening, but we, are, we have to, inv to invent many new ways to, to use new tools and to adapt to, to these tools and the new paradigm they, they create. Uh, a couple, of, uh, actually a month ago, there was in, in the animation field, there was like the biggest event that happens every year, which is in an the Annecy Festival in the, in the south of France. And uh, it was a great one uh, because uh, it didn't happen the last year <laughs> for obvious reasons. And, and uh, I mean, physically, at least. So, uh, so it was huge. And uh, a couple of years ago, when we actually we started uh, our company, or just before that, actually, uh, I was invited in Seagraph and uh, 
uh, in NEC as well, in SIGGRAPH in Los Angeles, in, at the pipeline conference as well, uh, to speak next to the frameworks. I was, so I was, you know, frameworks MPC, Disney, uh, Epic, and Unity. I was uh, like representing the small companies uh, starting to deal with new technologies and mostly game engines in animation. And uh, at that, that time, like three years ago, it was all about promises. We, it will work, uh, we will meet our <laughs> galaxies. Uh, your standards uh, will be integrated in the, the, the games uh, and you will only experience the, the, the gains, uh, like the, the real-time rendering to be able to, you know, to work in, in the final image, etc. That was the, the, the discourse like three years ago. But now this, this year, after many tries by many companies, uh, something and uh, actually lots of development from Unity and um, and uh, Unreal. I mean, uh, Epic building uh, Unreal Engine, the two main actually game engines uh, used in uh, used in virtual production and um, and animation and actually in games. Uh, the the wha what I said the 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 bullshit, if you can say, actually the the promises have become more real. Actually, the the people stop saying. Uh, unrealistic stuff and uh, the new way to see it was like, uh, you know, you everybody has to change their mindset actually. There are some stuff that won't actually work uh, very very well in game engine, never, because uh, some stuff that are actually needed in, uh, in animation and VFX, uh, because it's not really the same architecture of, uh, you, you cannot push the envelope that far, even though it looks like from, from the outside. Uh, so everybody has to to move forward a, a bit more. Uh, so so the the work is still to be done, and uh, what we experience is that only small and very um, uh, agile companies actually can can make such a stretch to to use and to work so differently. The big the big huge companies. They have so many, so much legacy, and s there's so much momentum. It's very hard to move to a new paradigm where actually it looks like using game engine for just f to use that topics is more like uh, shooting real life, you know, live events where you every tech is a bit different. You cannot actually uh, one of the the main frustration is repeatability. You know, you validate in animation, you work frame by frame, so that's. Already there is a, a, an issue here because that's the magic of animation. Every frame is made by hand for some reason. And some, some directors like Satoshi Kon, for instance, if you know him, a uh, very famous uh, Japanese director, he, he, could, he, can, he can make an animation director mostly, but he can make also live, uh, live action movies. But he said, actually, if I want to show something very specific in a one second shot, which is like very short, uh, I cannot actually control every, you know, frame, the, the 25 frames per second uh, on a live feature, the way I can on, a, on an animation show. And uh, sometimes you you want to get rid of some information to to, you know, to impress the, the brain with the right one, and etc. So there's there's something very specific in animation that you cannot do in live shows, and and that. And that, that frame, by frame by frame process actually goes against the um, the real time tech that is like super super fast. And uh, when you want to do frame by frame, you want time to build this frame by frame. So you don't actually need real time text everywhere in the whole process. But there are so many other jobs in uh, in animation, the lighting, for instance, where actually it's good. The lighting, the camera work, where you can be super good to have a uh, real-time uh, feedback. So there are many ways where uh, it can help. Uh, and other, other aspects of uh, filmmaking in animation that actually it, it's a problem to have a real-time uh, real tech. Actually, just the reviewing when you have real-time, if you want to, to take the benefit of a real-time technology, which uh, one of the benefits is you can create many iterations. So for the artist size, when he or she creates his, uh, his works, uh, having many iteration make, uh, makes the artist uh, able to, to push the envelope in the, in the same time frame way, fa way further. But uh, when you want to review stuff, and that can happen uh, lots of time, uh, unless you have the director or the supervisor next to you reviewing in real time as well, you actually don't benefit the real-time process. Which is something that happens in, in virtual production, and, and this is a 
uh, something that is also big in, in, in the industry right now. Um, and, and specifically, if we're talking about retro production, uh, Louisa, um, if, if you're talking about this, this uh, process, this new process of creating in real time, do you feel that um, it's, uh, it's something that is more driving creativity so that you will see a myriad of new projects? Or do you think that this is almost something because, like Quentin pointed out, it's, it's about also the, the changing the, the creative, creative process. So do you think that it's about creativity or it will just streamline production and maybe uh, not be so much uh, about creativity than it is about uh, streamlining the process and making something repeatable and more controllable? Um, so at the moment, I think that virtual production is, is, is such a big, um, you know, it grabs people's attention. Everybody wants to do it. So right now, you're finding people are doing it um, just to try it out and see see what happens, uh, see what they can achieve with it. And so I think that the output right now is actually quite creative. Um, after this wave has happened, I think what we're going to find is that people will they'll learn which tools are useful for which workflows, and they're going to start being a bit smarter and a bit more logical about what they pick, uh, which techniques, and um, and as well, I mean, I don't think you're going to get the creativity going away, um, but it will, you know, it will become more of like a, one of the tools in the bag that people use for production. Um, as well as that, the additional benefit, say, if you're using LED walls uh, to shoot, you can also take benefit of all of the sort of the virtual production workflow. So you, you automatically can use virtual scouting. You can automatically use um, augmented, well, with some work, augmented reality, et cetera, because you've already started to produce things in real time. Uh, so it does help that feedback loop where you can put things in front of a director. Very early on, uh, we do have a lot of director reviews in what we do. And we find that that just cements what people know they want to do before you actually get to shoot. So people, people make much smarter decisions ahead of time. Uh, so yeah, definitely, I think, I think that the creativity is a big part of virtual production. Mm -hmm. um, speaking about creativity um, and creating new projects, uh, oftentimes what is decisive is being able to fi actually finance and actually making these things happen. Um, and we know that a lot of projects actually die at this stage. You know, you, cre you create an awesome pilot, you have got an awesome script, it just never happens. Um, so this is where Web3 might come in and, and new venues of financing. So uh, Daryl, for example, um, how, do you, how does Web3 help? How can Web3 help in creating new venues of financing for movies? Yeah, I think that Web3 is really exciting because uh, it gets us as consumers involved in the earliest way possible, uh, which is really amazing because right now the way the system works, it doesn't make sense. If I go, like the show that I just sold uh, with Jimmy Kimmel, we went to ABC, we pitched them a project, they're like, great, we're gonna buy this and pay you to write it. They, they hear probably 400 pitches a year. They'll buy, let's say, eight or nine. Um, let's say they'll put f those eight or nine to a script. Four of those will actually go into production where they will actually shoot the very first episode. And then it really depends on their advertisers uh, which ones they will pick up. So they're gonna look at their slate and they're gonna look at their advertisers and say, okay, who can sell the most Coca-Cola? Now, from an artistic point of view, that's a terrible way to do business, and it's not a great business model, because what you have is a series of artists who are out there, and we're writing, we're creating very valuable, interesting products that should get the audience. There's a massive audience that wants to see this type of project, but for whatever reason, they can't get that through. And so what Web3 allows us to do is go to the consumers, to us, and we get a voice in the type of art that we want to see, because I can go, you know what, my values are aligned with this this filmmaker, or I want to see more of this type of movie or these underrepresented communities championed, and I can go invest my time, my energy, and my value into that, and that's very exciting. So like, we're seeing things, and I think you're doing this as well with NFTs, where we can do raises, where I can go to the community, I can say, hey, you know what? You're a fan of this filmmaker. You should be the first to profit on this uh, movie if that, if that happens. We offer the opportunity for you to come and experience the filmmaking process, where you can actually come to set or walk the red carpet behind your favorite cast and crew, go to the rap party afterwards. Maybe you're a collector and you're like, you know what? I would love to own Indiana Jones's 
whip and hat. Uh, so you buy it before the movie's made, and then after that movie's made, we ship the 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 prop to you directly, and then your NFT acts as a certificate of authenticity so that you can prove that this is the actual product that you purchased. And all of that goes while supporting the artists and the creatives. And then the best part is that the artists and the creatives get to own the rights to their project. So instead of having to go to Disney and say, hey, buy out my idea, and then maybe it never sees the light of day, I get to own it, I have that way I can champion that, and then we as the, the audience now can say, look, there's 10,000 people who believe in this project and this idea. We should see distribution. And it's an important topic as well in relation to real time, because one of the promises of real time is that it's, you're using game engines, and so you, cr you could create multiple experiences using the same tools. So in theory, you could create a video game and a, a film at the same time. But they're not the same venues of financing. You do not pitch a video game to a film distribution company it doesn't work like that. So you need new ways, new business models, and new ways of financing. What do you think, Olivia, about this? Uh, what kind of business models will we see, or, or ways, new ways of financing that you may, you've been maybe working on? I think you have to, right now with Web3, you have to think about your project, your movie, like a company. Each project is movie, each movie like a company. And you are. You need to find your audience since the beginning. You need to to show them you have the possibilities to fulfill the project because you have a lot of uh, shitty projects sometimes. <laughs> so, you, voila, you have to be. You have to make your own research, as we say all the time, and uh, and that's really complicated because uh, you have an idea. For me, right now, the most complicating thing is not to create, is not to make the movie, but is to find people to find. Uh, to build the audience, to go everywhere, to meet you today. Voilà. But, and I think you need to build a team around you very quickly and to go further together because with the NFT collection we have launched a few days ago, I think, imagine, you have 1,000 uh, NFTs in this collection. If, 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 this, if these 1,000 people uh, are engaging around, around you and are building with you, you can make many things, and I think you can find a developer, you can find a webmaster, you can find... You, you have to go together, you don't need to think like a lon lonely guy, but you need to think like, a, I don't know, a captain with a, a lot, a big crew <laughs> who will advance and grow uh, go far with you. So now you see a lot of initiatives, you have some Lumia project, for example, with uh, proposing uh, Metaverse and uh, AI. Also, sometimes now you have a lot of projects like this who want to analyze your script since the beginning to see if it's possible, to if you will find an audience. So I'm not saying it's maybe it's the good part, the good thing, because uh, sometimes you have a crazy uh, movie who, who, li who lived uh, with crazy stories. But um, I think it's a, a good idea because they are thinking about the projects with a 360 uh, proposition. You have a movie, you have a metaverse, you have an NFT, you have a ticketing. You, ha you have to think, it's, it's, it's crazy because you are the all, all chain all together, only, only you. Normally, you have, uh, when, you are, when you are going to Disney, you have, they are doing all these things for you. They are taking a lot of money, but they have all the chain. And, when you are a web tra guy, you have to do this all alone. So it's not very easy. Yeah, it is tough. And I, but I will say, like, Disney's not making these projects. People are making yeah. these projects. So the, the producers on these shows are human beings who deserve uh, to see the rewards that they're doing. Like, the goal for me is to protect the rights of all filmmakers and artists. And you do have a community around you, but it's, it's about finding the community that has the same vision and that the, your vision is aligned. So whether we're doing virtual production, you know, this is a human being that's setting up these stages. These are gaffers that are, that are setting up lights. You know, this isn't uh, a corporation or a machine. And all of these individuals, we have the common goal, which is to create cool art that people want to see and experience. And we can gather behind that vision as a community and say, yeah, we're going to make this piece of art. We're going to make this piece of film and we're gonna do it in a smarter way because the financial model as it exists doesn't make sense. Like the Kino model literally 
we we de-risk our film by getting people involved earlier, we can we can make more profit as a company and we can de-risk the process so that investors don't get screwed over in the long run and so that the PAs don't have to starve making minimum wage in a $212 billion industry. And uh, so circling back to, to, to what we said earlier, so let's say, we, you've gone through the step of financing your project, and now you're, you're entering the thick of production. Uh, so going back to Quentin, uh, let's say, so real time in this case, uh, what is the effect of the tech of using Unreal Engine in production on the industry uh, as at, la at large? You know, um, what is the difference between what's being promised, what was promised, and what is actually happening? So what would you say is the impact of using real time in the industry in production? So using game engines? Because so real-time yeah, modelers, textures, etc., they, they are working in real-time for decades now. So that's not the real change. The, the real change is because uh, new techs uh, makes people able to work in real-time together, like different jobs together. Like you can play animation and you can uh, frame it at the same time, which is another job, which I and uh, you can actually move the lights and light at the same time. So that's where real-time... Uh, or game engines, that, that's what they bring. So, um, so from what I just said, uh, you can see it's collaborati collaborativity, actually. We've the, f the first thing we've, we've made by experience in, in using game engines, it was in Unity, from, by the way, not Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine has, has a hype that it doesn't deserve, but they are <laughs> super rich, though, to be fair. They are super rich and very good at marketing, etc. But um, <coughs> they're super rich at, at selling skins in the in the closed environment, well. But they, they give a lot of their money away to, to creators, so kudos to them. But um, uh, so th we entered the, the that uh, realization by by uh, putting actually our storyboarder artists in uh, in three environments to help them storyboard better. So it was wha what is now called virtual scouting. And uh, we figured that, we realized by doing, we could compare exactly, that was the chance we had, uh, two seasons of the same series. It was a Heidi, uh, Heidi series, uh, you know, that little girl, little girl in the Swiss mountains, uh, uh, made in uh, animation, 3D animation, and it was the same teams, everybody, even the storyboard artists, the same animators, the same characters, the same environments, and uh, just by uh, putting the, mm, the storyboarders in a virtual, in an immersive environment, in, unit, in Unity, by the way, and not uh, on not giving them 3D uh, data on screen, and some you could use Maya or the 3D software and, and grab images from, from the screen and draw over them, etc. They did the same thing, grabbing images, but uh, from immersive environment. The, the only thing that changes is that being immersive, you have a way better sense of proportion, distance, volumes, etc. So. And it is all about that. When you frame in a 3D environment, you want to be like super accurate about that. The th what, what it changed, we realized, is that actually their animatics, which is the uh, s roughly animated storyboards, it was a, it's a 2D thing, but uh, was better actually. So the people working after them had less uh, issues, mistakes, uh, problems to solve, which is the layout people, the one who translate the animatics into uh, into uh, into 3D and uh, etc. And we've actually for one season we've uh, gained three uh, man years uh, of work. And uh, doing that actually it was collaborative. People could drop could could come in the in the in the scene together etc. So collaborativity, of course, iterations uh, and. Uh, and a new platforms, because as you said, when you create in real time, so at the, at the end of production, when you create in real time uh, with final pixel, like you render in uh, game engines, you can normally uh, maybe use the same data in a game and new platform, etc. We work a lot with uh, documentaries, for instance. For normally, that. maybe. Normally, <laughs> maybe. But everything I said has a problem. First, you have to transfer in a new workflow, which is, uh, that's a problem with uh, HR, actually. It's not the same people, the same education. So I work a lot with animation schools to evangelize them and to create new new courses, actually. And they have to, you know, build courses for the next five years, and it, it actually moves faster than that, the, that technology. So that's a problem. 
uh, new, new format, data formats, etc. That's an, another issue, actually. Some, some data cannot work, in a, and we need them in animation. And of course, the new platforms, the new markets, the new people we deal with, we, we, we deal now with architects, we deal with documentary people, we deal, they are all super smart people, etc. because we, we lower the, the price per minute, but uh, we have a lot of, lot of stuff to, we have to learn to work together, so that's an, another problem. So you said, you, it's interesting that you mentioned that you can lower the, the price uh, to minutes, so that there's also the question of costs and affordability and budgets. Uh, Louisa, maybe specifically uh, virtual production, what do you, how do you feel about how the impact of virtual production is on costs in real time? Do you feel that it lowers the cost or it is really just the same old? Yeah. Um, so we actually experienced something a little bit similar to what Quentin was saying, but obviously there's a lot of differences between animation and um, VFX and production. Um, we, we find that a lot of the, the cost in virtual production traditionally VFX comes at the end of the pipeline in post-production, whereas with virtual production, it comes up front. And what that means is you, you get a big load of money spent at the beginning, but you do see down the pipeline that there's a lot less issues and a lot less things going wrong. Um, so there w is a cost saving in that, um, but it, it happens at the end. So people, you know, people budgeting may think that they're you know, that it looks wrong because there's all this spend up front, but uh, really when you finish the, the, whole, the whole show, it should be, there should be a cost saving. Um, I personally like to think of it more as a creative tool and something that can allow a lot more freedom, uh, but I think the people doing the budgets would care a lot more about the money. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, I think, yes, there's definitely cost savings, especially when you use virtual production smartly, so using all the tool sets in the bag, so, um, you know, using scouting, uh, using the augmented reality up front so that you, when you come to, sh to shoot, you know what you're doing and you have a plan and you can, you can move through what you're doing very well. And if you're shooting for, you know, for a series, I would say that there's an additional cost benefit because you have a reduction on potentially the amount of stages that you need to rent out. Uh, you also, you know, some of these series have to store things for for years and that's quite expensive in itself so if you're using a lot of virtual production environments that that cost becomes much smaller so you, you can you can maybe store a few set pieces rather than having to rent out several stages for you know over over a number of years all right um i think we might be running out of time or we should go into q a right um we can continue the conversation but if you have any questions uh, now is the time for Q&A, so if you have any questions, you can raise your hands uh, and we can ask the panel. We have a question right here. Uh, maybe I'll give uh, my own mic. Yeah. No, it's okay. I can, I can okay. Yeah, I okay. Uh, thank you very much. This is cool. You guys have talked a lot about uh, kind of a lot of behind the scenes, uh, you know, creation and uh, artist, artist compensation, things like that. But I'm curious what you see in long term for the final product. Like, do you see it as, are movies going to look like movies? You know, does a show look like a show? Do you, is there a place where you, you imagine uh, you like to see people watching your content? Uh, just kind of very long term, I'm curious how you, how you see things. If I may, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think f I see the future as an integrated thing. And I think you we're kind of seeing Netflix try to do this now as they're moving into the gaming thing with like, uh, you know, uh, I personally believe that we're going into a, a a world of pure integration where we're gonna have a film, we're gonna have an IP around that, but also we'll have an environment that we can exist in. And maybe we exist and we do Q and A's with the cast and crew in that uh, session, but we could also play a game within that and that could unlock certain benefits. So, um, you know, I'm very excited about the type of storytelling that will evolve, but uh, to your point, I think we're at the very bleeding edge of this technology. And, and so it's very difficult to know even what the true utility is uh, to filmmakers and to the end consumer because right now you know the creative process kind of comes in three layers it's it's exploration it's creation and evaluation and then when we get to the evaluation stage we'll say okay how can we do this more smartly right now we're in the exploration stage we're kind of discovering what we can do with this um, all right we we have one more question and then I think we have to to uh, yeah uh, do you want to you want the mic okay 
Hello, thank you, everyone. I'm in the movie business, so I want to know the distributor are now very reluctant to adopt any uh, form of uh, uh, tools of uh, production. We see that in Cannes, of course. Uh, now Binance has launched uh, an NFT uh, platform, especially for movie. There are three, four initi initiatives that uh, we could see. What is your advice about that? What is your fault? Yeah. Uh, I think what you're saying is that distribution is an issue, yes. and yes, and it is true. When you when you have a final product, most movies don't see distribution, and that is an issue. But what we're seeing right now in this kind of Web two streamium pop up, right? So we have like the Netflixes and the Tubies, and you know, IMDb has its own channel now. So there there are. Oh, uh, options that are opening up, but I think that Web3 distribution will be a thing. When you look at things uh, like LivePeer, what they're able to do uh, by sharing these massive files in a much more efficient way, I think that we're going to find uh, Web3 distribution companies that also come up. And we're seeing people explore with like NFTs as passes so that you can actually use this as a way to see that. I think that we're in the exploration phase. And so right now, we're going to see a lot of very cool, unique, creative things that may not live past the next two years, but they will be very important stepping stones to the future of what streaming can be. And, and in a dream world, we're, we're moving to a place where every piece of art can find its audience. And it's more about how we curate that and help people find and connect with the pieces of art that they're trying to connect with. Do you believe in a, a release of a film in the metaverse? Anyone? Any metaverse? Uh, or a special metaverse? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think where we're at right now, um, it's a possibility. Uh, to where that bulky Oculus system might be difficult, I'm open to anyone else's opinions here, but I think that in the future, uh, we will have those environments, and it's a virtual theater, and maybe that is a way that we engage with it. Yeah, to, to add to that, actually, what my, my thought about uh, w what I get from trying this new technology that was sold as uh, disruptive, but uh, for now disturbing, <laughs> uh, because everything is, has to be we thought uh, there is a trend though, which is uh, every time a technology permits it or, st or stop preventing it, uh, people uh, tend to to work like they would do naturally on stage, like like kids actually. They would play. Uh, with a lot of interactivity together. So actually, we go back more and more, uh, even in animation, when you do stuff frame by frame and uh, you create a background uh, separately from the rest, etc. Uh, more and more, the technology allowed people to work uh, on a big sandbox, on, on a stage, and to create stuff on the fly, etc. And, and people tend to use that, actually. So it, it goes more and more into theater. And I think uh, the metaverse being immersive and uh, the presence being one of the topic of the metaverse, the, speci the specificity, uh, we will go more and more into actually uh, invited people, inviting audience on stage, uh, could be cinema stage and VFX, etc. It's going to be more immersive even for them. So it's going to be play on the metaverse, but it's not going to be film. It's going to be experiences, but maybe a world as a film. Uh, well, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Let's give it up for our awesome speakers. And we'll stick around for a few minutes if you want to talk to us, if you have any questions.